some of these smaller stories or these strange occurrences tend to get lost in the shuffle of time. And so um, this is part of the, this is my contribution hopefully to Colorado history to try to preserve um, some of the more unique aspects of our culture. Let's see, let's see, I should go here. Okay, the table of contents of the book um, is Denver's Hard Scrabble Beginnings, Gold, um, The First Rush, Trouble on the Plains, Mining the Miners, um, which is a talk that I've really already done for Steamboat Springs, um, Growing Pains, The Meeker Massacre and the Death of Utopia, The Hard Men, Gunslingers and Outlaws, The Great Silver Rush, Gold and Cripple Creek, Buffalo Bill, and Retribution in Northwestern Colorado, and the Cemetery Scandal. So for today's talk, what I am doing is I am basically talking about Denver's origins and the Colorado's origins, Trouble on the Plains, and the Gunslingers and Outlaws, because I think you guys um, get a fair amount of information about the Bassets and all of that um, from Northwestern Colorado. So my basic premise in Colorado history is that the state was not settled by temperate, well-adjusted people. So whether you're reading my nonfiction or my fiction, um, I think that point's probably going to come across. Um, here is a picture of one of the earlier photographs of Denver. It's a camp on a creek near Denver is what the caption says. Um, and as you see, there's really nothing much to it. So that looks about how Denver started out. When we think about building the territory, uh, the Colorado Territory, and who is doing the building, I did want to look at some of the assumptions we make, um, you know, just stories that we just take for granted, and just to make sure that they were true. And one of those um, stories or theories that I'd grown up with was Colorado was just filled with men, there weren't any women. And I was like, well, is that true or is that not true? So I looked at the first census, which was taken in 1860, and there were 32,654 people, of which 31,077 were men. So that gave you a female to male ratio of 20 to 1. If you look deeper into the statistics of men age 20 to 30, that figure was 17,604 to 520 females in that same age group. That gives you a ratio of 34 to 1. Then if you look at men age 30 to 40, um, there was 10,511 to 278 women, a ratio of 38 to 1. So in my mind, that does really prove that um, women were a rare commodity in the state. So basically you have a bunch of guys who have come out to follow the gold. So one of my premises is a lot of our Wild West behavior probably was fueled by alcohol. So I always kind of um, show this just for a reference point and because this is um, the history happy hour. Um, watered down whiskey, well, whiskey, started out probably being just fine coming in whiskey barrels, but then it was hard to get across the plains, right? And so when it got into the saloons or the bars in Denver or up in the mountains, enterprising saloon keeps would understand that if you watered the whiskey down, it would go further. Tea or tobacco juice was added for color when they did water it down, and the price was 25 cents a shot. That doesn't sound like a lot, but 25 cents translates into about $7 of today's money. So that is like a, not a cheap drink in my mind. Bogus whiskey was made with raw ethyl alcohol. It would have certain additives added in depending on who was doing the mixing. It could have tobacco juice, gunpowder, prune juice, tree bark, molasses, sagebrush, strychnine, turpentine, creosote, Rattle, even rattlesnake heads. Why they would do that, I don't know. But here's a story about whiskey um, from, the, from a contemporary of the time, a man named Robert Kirkpatrick in 1863. The whiskey was often made with two barrels of water and a few plugs of tobacco with a quantity of camphor and a little strychnine to give it a tang to one barrel of pure whiskey, making three barrels of red eye. When the 40 rod, 
got near the bottom of the barrel, it was so dangerous that a man sometimes dropped dead from the effect of a few glasses, having too much tang near the bottom of the barrel. We also had um, vigilante justice. So you do hear the, the notion, you know, string them up, you know, law enforcement was better in the old days because justice was swift and all of that. Um, here is a fairly famous photograph from, all the photographs, by the way, are from the Denver Public Library, unless otherwise noticed, but this is a fairly famous picture. We did have several hanging trees in Denver, and here he is hung up. Um, he might or might not have killed a man, um, but generally speaking, the people of the time just thought he was a bad character, so they just went ahead and killed him, I guess, to prevent additional problems. There is an interesting letter to the editor that I have included in my book. And this one was written in 1871. And even at that, what I'd consider early year, people were looking back to this early vigilante justice, um, probably with nostalgia. It reads as follows to the editor. What is to be done to check the flood of crime that overwhelms our territory? Murders are of almost daily occurrence. Rapes, assaults, and thefts are alarmingly frequent. Criminals seem to think that hanging is played out, and they indulge in a carnival of crime without restraint. The postponement of murder trials from term to term of court, or the change of place from county to county, is rightly looked upon as the high road to acquittal and freedom of the blood-stained criminals. Each new crime eclipses its predecessors, and there is sharp competition for the championship. In this dire emergency, it is more than whispered that a resort to the old time vigilance process is the only recourse left. A quick run on a short string of murders and cutthroats, a la 1861, would clear the atmosphere and doubtless save valuable lives. All good citizens in common with your correspondent will deploy the necessity for such a course, but what else can we do? It has saved us from anarchy before. The law seems powerless and desperate diseases require severe remedies. Shall the ball go on or will the bloody record be brought to a close by a stretching of hemp? Signed a 59er. <clears throat> um, one interesting thing about Denver, and I guess I really even didn't know this when I started the research, was the fact that we did have banks and mints um, very early on in our career, and that gold dust was actually um, a, a monetary means of exchange in all businesses. So here is one early such bank and mint. It is believed that this Clark Gruber and company never actually did mint coins, but um, they did have gold safes for their gold in the back. And here's just an old picture of it. Um, old gold state safes still abound. Um, there's some in um, the lower downtown area of Denver. If you get to go into the basements um, and skulk around down there, um, I've seen them up in Georgetown and I'm, pr I'm pretty sure um, Steamboat Springs will have some too. Um, one of our earliest citizens was a man named Libius Barney. He was a correspondent to um, a newspaper back, I think, in Vermont or Maine, where he came from. He turned out to be an unsuccessful prospector, but he and he actually made more money sweeping up gold dust with a turkey wing and a whisk broom after his shift in a saloon than he ever did in prospecting. So um, that said, all that gold dust, he managed to accumulate enough of it to open up the Apollo Theater with his gold dustings. So that's pretty wild. Here's a picture of the Gregory Gold Diggings. Um, this is out of the central city, Nevada, the Blackhawk area. And this is a, it's supposed to be a picture of 1859. So this is when the world's richest square mile was born. John Gregory, a man who was near destitute and starving, found yellow metal along Vasquez Creek, which is what we now call Cripple Creek. He found what he considered a highly promising vein, but it snowed that same night. He was also forced to return into town, meaning Golden, because Golden was a supply center, 
So he went into a golden saloon and he started talking. He met a man from Indiana, a Hoosier. He was actually grub staked by this David K. Wall, a man who had just come west with a wagon load of provisions. So miraculously, Gregory managed to return to the same spot in the spring and miraculously he found the same vein. Um, I don't, you know, everybody in Colorado goes up to the mountains, but in my mind, it's really hard if you find something that you think is really cool and you go away from six months and try to find it again in the mountains. To me, it's near impossible, but this man had astounding luck. He was followed by William Green Russell, and William Green Russell came with 170 men and established Russell Gulch. At the end of the season, he took back $21,000 worth of free gold. And what I mean by free gold is the gold you can get out by panning. It's um, near the surface or in the streams. Others made valuable finds as well. However, the discovery out of the William Green and John Gregory findings was that of the Gregory load, which afterwards yielded millions of dollars. Um, to note, one dollar in um, 1859 was worth 31.75 in 2020 dollars. So that $21,000 equates to $666,000 in today's money. Um, once again, that was the easily extracted gold. So the initial impressions of Colorado as a territory and a place to live um, are kind of they're pretty telling. Um, here's a couple of ones that are in the book. Men are perfectly crazy. Gambling and whiskey drinking flourish here extensively. Tanglefoot whiskey sells for 25 cents a drink and would almost make a man shed his toenails. I find a much better town here than I expected. Denver and Auraria, taken collectively, make quite a large place. I will write you again soon if I do not immediately come home. Libius Barney. Um, you know, just kind of reading that, I mean, it's kind of hard to tell if he was like happy or unhappy. Um, I guess if he was really unhappy, he would have turned around and gone home. Um, we did have a fairly large phenomenon of that happening. When a lot of the prospectors came out in 1859 and um, 1860, 61, if they couldn't make a living and if they ended up starving, um, they would often turn back to go home to where they originated from and they were called go backers. Here's another, um, qu another um, story of an initial impression by Bernard Taylor, who was also a traveler and a correspondent. I am already tired of the bald, clumsy-shaped, pockmarked mountains. This one long, windy, dusty street with its perpetual menace of fire, and this never-ending production of specimens and offer of feet, and shall joyfully say goodbye tomorrow morning. Um, what he is referring to with this offer of feet is um, mines to get investors used to sell um, mine footage or prospective vein footage by the feet. So you could go and buy like a foot of the bobcat mine or five feet of some other mine. Um, so that's just, um, just a point of reference. Here is a picture of a map and this has Colorado's early trails, sports and battlefields. Um, this one is gonna be really hard for you all to see, but you can see Basically, the um, Santa Fe Trail comes up from the bottom, the south goes up north. The Smoky Hill Trail is coming up um, through Kansas, sorry, from Kansas and up to about, I'd say where Pueblo was. And the Overland Trail is coming from um, the Nebraska area. The Oregon Trail did dip in slightly near Julesburg and those were our main trails. And so there were forts all put along the, um, the Eastern Plains, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Um, so when the Civil War broke out in what was called the States back East, Denver, Denver split along both political lines. So Denver proper itself kind of 
tended towards the union lines. And this is what we're seeing here with the Denver City Guard. Um, this is a really early picture that I just found on the Denver Public Library website. So I was delighted to find that. And then you had another group called the Bummers who tended to live in a rare area and were mainly southern leaning. So that's kind of a thing to keep into mind. So here is again the Denver City Guard. It's they're soldiers, but they're also almost like a vigilance committee at that time. But the business, the busy mining camps of Central City and Nevadaville um, were the primary targets for the recruiters of either side. Um, our gold fields also attracted the attention of the Confederacy, and a plot was born to raid, born to raid Colorado's gold fields in 1862. An interesting thing to note with many miners, especially those who are struggling, actually returned to their states of origin to take part in the war. Union recruits from Denver were offered three meals a day and the pay of $11 per month. So if they were starving up in Central City or what have you and standing in cold water, panning for gold and not really making much, all of a sudden this $11 and your food, taken, food and lodging taken care of, um, seem to um, attract a certain quantity of miners. Interestingly enough, Pueblo followed more Confederate sympathies and they established relay stations to um, provide aid for the Confederate cause. Um, Colonel John Heffinger raised a troop of 600 Confederates in Mesa's Hole, which is in Southern Colorado, and Denver's founding fathers raised Union troops, by and large. Um, according to historical accounts from the time, the new soldiers were as ill-fed and ill-clothed as they were drunk and undisciplined. Um, by all accounts of the time, um, it didn't really matter what uniform they were wearing. It just so happened the streets of Denver were filled with Union troop uniforms. But the women in the town were very ill at ease um, with these drunken, undisciplined miners coming down from the hills, um, drinking really to pass their time and accosting people on the street. So I guess it was really quite tense in Denver in those years. Um, but that's not to say, again, that there weren't Confederate sympathizers. This picture here is titled Mozart Hall, and it's on Larimer Street. And its original proprietor was a man um, known as Charlie Harrison. And at that point, that building was called the Criterion. And Charlie Harrison was the proprietor and a gunslinger, gamble, gambler, and Confederate sympathizer. And he owned this um, saloon. Um, actually, I'm going to go backwards if I can. Whoops. Nope. Never mind. Um, let's see. I wish I could go back. Hold on. Hold on. This is not going the right way. Okay. Um, what is interesting about Charlie Harrison is his the back of the Criterion Saloon backed right up, up to the Union Army barracks. And so this was where the Confederate sympathizer of the gambling element hung out. Um, they were probably fewer in number, but they were very vocal in their support. And they made no secret of the fact that the Union soldiers weren't particularly welcome within their establishment. Um, and the Union guys didn't really take too kindly to all of that. And at one point, they actually took one of the cannons from one of, their, um, one of their parade grounds or whatever, wheeled it up to the front of this door here and stuck it into the saloon as a warning to the Confederate people that they would in fact be served liquor there. Um, Charlie Harrison unfortunately murdered a black um, man who was playing at the establishment. Um, and it really did have racial tones even back in the day. And after the trial, he was acquitted. Um, Byers, the head of the Rocky Mountain News, was very much a union supporter. He was very much appalled with the non-guilty verdict that got returned in Charlie Harrison's case because he did kill this um, man. And Harrison basically left Denver, never to return. He went down to Texas and he joined up 
um, with the Confederates and actually led a force. And I think I'll tell you what happened to him, but we'll see if we can get a little bit further. Um, also of interest during this time is some of our biggest um, heroes and some of our greatest villains were also born in this really turbulent time of when the Civil War was going on, even though we were out, um, out here in Colorado. The first picture is of George Bent. He is the half-breed son of William Bent, the man who founded Bent's Fort down in La Junta. And um, George's mother was a Cheyenne Indian. This is a picture of him and his first wife, who I believe's name was Owl Woman. But George Bent even got involved in the war. He was sent to boarding school in Missouri by his father. When the fighting broke out, he actually joined the Confederates. Um, something went wrong with um, his stint there. I think maybe they, he and some other men deserted. One of his brothers or cousins was in, Saint, um, was in Missouri at the same time buying um, supplies for the trading post. Got somehow his brother off, put him in the boat. They went back to Colorado um, to resume trading. But it's interesting that a half-breed Cheyenne man fought for the Confederates. And so he came back to Colorado and he really felt perhaps more at home um, with his mother's people, the Cheyenne. So he was literate, obviously having gone to boarding school, he could speak Cheyenne and speak English um, probably perfectly. And he was in fact in the Sand Creek Massacre in Black Kettle's camp when the hostilities, um, when the massacre broke out. So he is kind of a very interesting witness that we don't really hear a lot about in Colorado history, but there he is. The man in the middle is Silas Sewell, who comes across as really one of the heroes in this whole debacle. Um, Silas Sewell came from the East Coast. Um, he refused to let his men join in the attack onto Black Kettle's camp and the Sand Creek Massacre. He said what they were seeing went against all principles of modern warfare, humane warfare. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't done to kill women and children. Um, one interesting story I did hear, I think on PBS, um, about Sand Creek remnant um, memories, perhaps, was there was a woman who was um, a Cheyenne woman, and when asked who her greatest hero in life was, she actually came up with Silas Sewell here in the middle because he did not take part in the atrocities. He's buried in uh, Riverside Cemetery in Denver. If you ever are down here and want to go to the Pioneer Cemetery, he is buried there. The man on the right, this is not the best photograph, but that's Colonel John Shivington. Now, Colonel John Shivington at one point was definitely the toast of Colorado when he headed off the Confederate gold raid plot in the Battle of Glorieta when the Confederate troops had basically taken New Mexico. Um, they were on their way up to the gold fields of Colorado. Somehow he heard that they were might be coming and several um, battalions rode hard all the way down to Trinidad, Colorado. They happened to be crossing the pass. They intercepted the Texans and there was a battle and Shivington's um, men prevailed. So that is just what is going on now. Um, so when Shivington returned to Denver, he was really seen as a hero because he he saved the Colorado gold fields. Then he still was in the army, but he has became reviled years later, may I hasten to add, for the part he let he took in leading um, the Sand Creek massacre. So while the Civil War is going on. We still had trouble on the plains um, with the Indians and with settling um, the Eastern part of the territory. The war on the plains in these years was in full force and we didn't really have a lot of men. Um, 
which sounds crazy, but the men we had were either doing mining or they had gone to their states of origin to fight in the Civil War, or they had perhaps joined um, the Colorado Battalion, which was small, or maybe they were even in the cavalry, but the cavalry men were getting siphoned off to really go fight um, the war between the states. So this presented Colorado with a, man, um, a manpower problem. And so somebody came up with the great idea of approaching the Confederate prisoners of war, often um, times, I think it was in Rock Island, Illinois, and asked these Confederate prisoners of war if they wanted to come out and man the forts um, in the Western United States. So that would be the plains of Western Nebraska, of Eastern Colorado, of Eastern um, Wyoming and Montana. A lot of men decided they would prefer to come out to the West rather than staying in prison. Um, one poor um, transplant was recorded as saying, man, have you ever seen so much of nothing? And I think probably if you came from a Southern state that was green and lush with big trees, at least that's how I imagine it, um, to go out onto the Eastern Plains of Colorado, probably was a rather um, a shock to the system. So in those days, the cavalry was charged um, not with just manning forts and fighting Indians, but they also were charged with escorting wagon trains on trails, um, especially if there were hostilities in the area. They were charged with repairing telegraph lines um, which would often get cut down by the Indians who did understand that those wires did somehow convey messages and, um, you know, troops would arrive, you know, and they knew they, they knew to put those two together. Um, we talked about George Bent, who was um, taking part in a lot of the activities, Sand Creek Massacre. Um, back to Charlie Harrison. He was um, killed by the Osage in Oklahoma in June 1863. Theory had it he too was um, planning a return up to Colorado to raid the gold fields. His death, um, I guess he was balding by this time, and so the Indians really couldn't scalp the top of his head, so they scalped his um, beard off his face thus proving that he was killed um, by the Indians. And his death actually did go a long way to snapping Colorado's Confederate connection. Um, one of the sad stories, in addition to the atrocities of the Sand Creek Massacre, was what happened to Silas Sewell. Um, Silas Sewell did testify against Colonel Shivington and the barbarity of what had transpired. He was recently married, um, I think he was married about three weeks, when he heard gunshots um, on the streets of Denver on April 23rd, 1865. He went to investigate what had happened and he was um, shot. So normally people would think that was just maybe a murder gone wrong, um, but this was actually a political assassination. And his friends made sure that they told um, anybody who would listen that this was a politically motivated killing. And one of Silas Sewell's best friends who was also going to testify about um, this new event was um, murdered himself as well. He was poisoned while staying in a hotel in Denver. So that was really pretty rough times. So in retaliation for the bloodshed at the Sand Creek Massacre, a lot of the Cheyenne, some Arapaho, and Sioux um, all converged on the fledgling town of Julesburg. Here is a picture of Julesburg, um, I believe the first time it fell, and then a month later it fell again by the same Indians. George Bent was actually one of the people, one of the men who attacked um, Julesburg, and you can read his accounts. Um, I think the book is out of print, but it's still widely available, and it's interesting just to read um, a man's viewpoint who was kind of on both sides of the coin as it were. So he did take part place in the retaliation. Basically all of the eastern side of Colorado was engulfed in violence at this point because um, single settlers were um, killed, stage stations were torched, wagon trains couldn't go through unless they were in groups of like a hundred. Um, 
banded together for safety's sake because the Indians were literally um, waging war against the invasion of their territory. Here's a picture of a stage st stop on the Smoky Hill Trail. And here's some miners. Um, I left this in here in this position just because all of the stuff is going on. And I just want um, everybody to kind of keep in mind that the mining just still went on. So this is a picture of men getting load, lowered down in a bucket, a mine bucket, and they have their candles for light. So this is a fairly early picture. So then we come to the hard men, um, Colorado's gunslingers and outlaws. So what is really interesting about um, some of the research I did is I could look up people that I would consider to be famous uh, frontiersmen, and they all had something to do with Colorado at one point or another. Um, we had Jack Slade, Butch Cassidy, who was a first known as Leroy Parker, Bat Masterson was here, Doc Holliday was here, Buffalo Bill, Texas Jack Omohundro, Calamity Jane, and Annie Oakley. There were also the Earp brothers came up after the OK Corral. Um, Wyatt Earp was definitely here and one of his brothers was as well. So here is a picture of some of our gunslinging men. Um, the man, um, the left is Jack Slade. The top picture is a very famous picture of Butch Cassidy in the Wild Bunch. The middle picture is supposedly a likeness of Doc Holliday. Then comes Bat Masterson, and then there comes Butch Cassidy, a younger picture than the one of him seated above. So Jack Slade is a really interesting character that we don't often hear that much about. Um, but he did leave quite a mark on Western history. The man had a definite problem with alcohol. By all accounts, he was really fairly pleasant, definitely industrious when he was sober. But when he drank, I guess he was just a nightmare. He was um, a stagecoach superintendent and the overlet an Overland Express superintendent, and he worked for the wagon master Ben Holiday on the plains. Um, let's see. He was actually from a fairly good family. He was born in Illinois, and his um, father was an Illinois politician. Um, during the Mexican War, he served in the Army, and then he came out west. Uh, he married a woman named Maria Virginia, and I don't know if any of you have ever been to Virginia Dale, Colorado. It's on the road between um, Fort Collins and Laramie. Virginia Dale was named for her, and he was um, a stage manager at Virginia Dale as well. He did have problems in Julesburg. Um, he, when he was the superintendent there of the Overland Express, um, Jules Benny was stealing from the operation, and um, Jack Slade really took offense to that. He fired Benny. Benny tried to kill him. Um, and by account, Slade was so badly shot up or riddled by bullets from Jules Benny. He was like a sieve, according to the station agent, James Boner. But Slade had his revenge. Um, he, some of his men, he um, talked them into retaliating Jules Benny, and Jules Benny was killed. Um, the story has it that Slade cut off both of Benny's ears and wore them as a necklace around his neck. I don't know if that is true or not. Um, at time, he just, the, his job in Virginia Dale didn't really suit him after a particular period in time. He went up to Virginia City, Montana. Once again, Montana had vigilantes like we had down in Denver. He was seen as just being an overall nuisance in Montana, and he was hung by the vigilantes. Um, the story is that he asked to see his wife before he was hung um, by the neck. A friend rode out to get his wife, who was about eight miles away, and even though she galloped back down to Virginia City to try to say goodbye to her husband, he had been hung only moments before, so she missed him. Um, when they took, cut him down from the um, hanging, 
She refused to have him buried in uh, Montana because they had killed him. So she was going to try to take his body back to Illinois. So she got a lead coffin and filled it up with whiskey. And she made it as far as um, Salt Lake City. But in Salt Lake City, apparently um, his body really started to smell and decompose. So the story goes that they left him there. Um, they put him in the ground and they were going to return his wife and whomever else to remove his body and still take him back to Illinois. But um, nobody came back for him. And he is buried actually in the stranger's lot in, the Salt Lake, in one of the Salt Lake City um, cemeteries. So that's Jack Slade. You can still see his old stage um, station if you go into Virginia Dale. And um, just, you know, Jules Benny. Jules Benny was the namesake of Julesburg. So it's just kind of interesting to hear who some of our original inhabitants were. Here's an older picture of the stage stop at Virginia Dale. It looks about the same to me today. Um, Doc Holliday was also in Colorado. What he termed the unpleasantness at the OK Corral actually did spill into Colorado. Um, when the OK Corral happened, um, the men left Arizona and most of them came up to Colorado, which was a fact that I certainly didn't know before I started doing the research for this. Doc Holliday did suffer from tuberculosis. He started out in Denver, um, but he actually got arrested on a street corner here. He got put into jail and almost extradited to Arizona on request of the group called the Cowboys. It just so happens that Bat Masterson was the sheriff of Trinidad when this all happened. So um, I think maybe the Earps or some other friends of Doc Holliday got word down to Bat Masterson who convinced the arresting officers here not to return him to Arizona. So Doc was released um, on his own reconnaissance, and he was allowed to do what he wanted. So he could have stayed in Denver, but he actually decided to move up to Leadville, which would have had to have been horrible considering um, his tuberculosis. Um, up at the high altitude, um, where obviously it's fairly cold, his laudanum and drinking problem worsened. Um, you know, and he kind of went into this spiral downhill. So when he, he was drunk, you know, his playing and gambling didn't go very well. It got worse. Um, he was actually hired at the Monarch Saloon up in Leadville, where he banked Faro, which Faro was a game at the time. And up in Leadville, miles and miles away from Arizona, one of his, an old enemy from his tombstone days named John Taylor walked into where he was working. Um, John Taylor tried to incite public opinion against Doc Holliday and succeeded to a large extent. Um, Doc Holliday's last gunfight was at Hyman's Saloon in Leadville over $5. Holliday actually believed a man who entered the saloon that he shot, a man named Billy L. Allen, was selected to kill him by um, his old nemesis, John Taylor. Um, he ended up getting arrested. He got released. It was considered in self-defense. Um, and Holiday ended up dying in Gledwin Springs, November 8th, 1887. Um, one of the strange things about that is they are not, they being um, archeologists and historians, he does have a grave up in Glenwood Springs, but nobody is exactly sure where his um, burial is or his body is. So I think they just put a tombstone wherever convenient. So Doc Holliday lived next to the Tabor Opera House. So I'm showing you a picture of that. It could be like in this little tiny white building um, to the left, or it could be in this larger building that says Billiard Hall written on the side. The building on the right was the um, Clarendon Hotel, which is fine and fancy. And so Doc, with his limited resources, would not have been able to afford that. Um, here's just some pictures of um, saloons, gambling saloon establishments in Leadville. So he would have hung out in places like that. And here's an outside picture of Hyman's saloon where his last gunfight took place. Um, Bat Masterson actually came out from Kansas to Colorado to take part in the Royal Gorge War in 1878. 
Um, that was basically an industrial action war. Um, one of the funnier newspaper articles was in a Denver newspaper kind of screaming like we've been invaded by Kansas. Um, Colorado's governor did not ask for these um, Kansas, I don't know, hired guns to come in and help restore order, but um, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad had. So they did come into the Royal Gorge War. Bat Masterson afterwards um, became the Sheriff of Trinidad. He lost his bid for re-election in 1879, like, likely partially due to the events of the OK Corral. He settled in Denver by 1886. He met his wife in Denver, a dancing juggler named either Emma Walters or Emma Moulton. He owned Chet Ed Chase's Palace Theater reportedly at one point. In 1900, uh, Masterson, who was a Canadian citizen, left Colorado with hard feelings never to return. Um, it was something to do perhaps with his inability to vote. He became a prize fighter promoter dying in New York City in 1921. And here's a picture of Ed Chase's Palace Theater. Now, this is one of the most ill-advised photographs in history, and this is of the Wild Bunch. Um, Pinkerton detectives were after um, Butch Cassidy, seated here, but they didn't know what he looked like. After they got this picture, he, they knew what he looked like, um, so he really shouldn't have done that. Um, Butch Cassidy's history in Colorado was that he moved to Telluride in 1884, perhaps, or most likely to deliver stolen horses. In 1887, he met Matt Warner there, who was at that time a racehorse race horse owner. Later, he would become a member of the Wild Bunch. July 4th, 1889, a bank robbery was held at the San Miguel Valley Bank in Telluride. I think they got, gosh, I'm, if memory serves, about $12,000. Um, it wasn't bad for the time, day and time. In 1894, Cassidy was arrested in Wyoming on charges of horse theft um, of a $5 horse. Chances are he was really more arrested for running a protection racket in the Dubois area um, of Wyoming. He was sent to the Wyoming Penitentiary. And surprisingly enough, um, his neighbors petitioned for his release, probably because they were afraid of him. Um, the Wyoming governor actually bought it, interviewed him in person, and released him, um, thinking he was going to go straight. He did not go straight. Um, he had 12 years of hell raising after being pardoned by the governor. Cassidy died, or did he, in Atocha, San Vicente, Canton, uh, Bolivia, November 7th, 1908. Especially people up in the Browns Park area. Um, Reported seeing Butch Cassidy, people who knew him before he went to Bolivia in his later years. So they believe he actually came back to the States and has probably died either in Colorado or in California, depending on which account you're reading. So um, yeah, so that is basically my um, presentation for the evening. Um, this is the book that I was taking most of my information out of, The Bad Old Days of Colorado, Untold Stories of the Wild West. Um, I also have The Beaten Territory that I think the museum has copies of, and The Spoiled Quilt, which is an anthology. And The Beaten Territory is getting released in paperback with a different name, Market Street Madam, in April 2021. And that's all I've got. That's, a, that's it about me if you have any questions. Oh, I get chats. Okay. Let's see. So I had asked if people had questions that they could type into the chat. I don't see any. Um, I had made the comment when you talked about all of the bad people from Colorado. I added the Bassett women and Tom Horn to that. Yep. And totally. of, course, of course, there are many, many more, but those were just two that came to mind that have been the subject of other talks that we've done. Um, oh, the Battle of Julesburg was the top, uh, one of our topics, of, and the Bassett women and Tom Horn were all covered in other talks by other speakers. So it was interesting to hear you pull um, some of the other people in. 
Yep, and it does have a lot of the Bassett women and the Lawless um, Browns Park, but I saw that, um, what's her name, uh, Linda Womack did a talk for you just, or it was aired a couple of months ago, so I wanted to make sure I steered clear of that because there's probably only so many um, horse wrestling and cattle wrestling a person can take, right? <laughs> so, exactly. Uh, yeah, so... Um, Elizabeth Bell, I see you're a writer, so that's exciting. I think I've met you before, maybe. So, um, yeah. And you can also, I can, um, if you want to unmute, I think maybe you can. I'm not sure if you can, actually, with this setup. Um, let's see, I can ask all to unmute, and then you can just kind of mute in if you want to. Oh, Brandy, I just muted you, so you'll have to unmute. I can unmute. <laughs> Good. Does anybody want to ask a question instead of type a question? Feel free. Well, it looks like everybody's maybe good that they liked it. So that's good. Um, so we'll have all, we have access to all of Randy's books, which is great. And like I said um, earlier on, you can um, email me at cbannister at treadofpioneers.org and I can um, do appointment shopping for you here in the museum store, or we can also um, get this book to you just by emailing me and we can order it. I'm sure we can get it um, by the holidays. So um, that should be no problem. Um, otherwise, we've recorded the talk. I'll put it up on YouTube and Facebook tomorrow. And that way, uh, if you want to share it with somebody else or recommend it to someone else, they can see it. Um, but thank you everybody for joining and thank you so much, Randy, for doing this talk again. You're always such a great speaker to have come up here and hopefully next year's History Happy Hour will be in person at the brewery where we can all have a beer together and toast that History Happy Hour is in person again. I would love that. So thank you very much. I really like, um, I love um, doing stuff with you guys up in Steamboat and I'm starting to feel like I'm knowing people and it's just so, such a pleasure to see everybody and get yeah. to share the home with you all. Well, we had a great turnout tonight and so um, I'm thrilled that everybody could join and like I said, stay in touch with us on Facebook and YouTube. We'll continue to do these uh, films the second Wednesday of each month at six and then History Happy Hour is the first Tuesday of each month at 30 um, and then all the in-person tours here uh, this winter outside where we can be together at a distance in the cold weather. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks Candace. Bye Thank everyone. You. Thank you so much.